Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis. I'm your host, Deacon John, joined by co-host Jason Memo. Hello, Jason. Hello. And we have our guest, uh, His Eminence, uh, the patriarch of the Joe and I Church, Sean McCann. Hello, Your Eminence. Hello, hello. So this is part two of, we, we won't say part two of two, perhaps part two of an endless series uh, on, on the Joe and I uh, legend, on the Joe and I church, on the roots of the Joe and I church. And we're specifically talking about the late 1700s, the 1800s, so the 19th century, and Bob Ray Palaprat, who established, brought into the world uh, unveiled if you like depending on on your beliefs uh the the joe and i church uh, of which the ajc has lineages from and is in some ways if you saw our last episode to send it from by the way you should just really watch the last episode this is definitely one that you you don't want to jump into because we're going to jump into it ourselves uh so we gave a lot of background definitely check that out it'll be linked below i promise i'll put that link in uh before we get there uh you should also watch that show because this eminence gave us a great commercial for our patreon but before we move on i'll give a much shorter one which is patreon.com slash gnostic and one-time donation donations at paypal.me slash gnostic okay uh jason i understand that, that you we were talking about myths and legends that's how we ended the 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 previous program i understand that that you have a question continuing these topics go for it jason yeah well it's because i think like there's often uh when you hear these myths and legends and when you hear them as they relate to uh to to a group that is operating as a church so which is to say not just as a study group or an academic uh, um, uh, school or something like that. But this is like, no, we, we're, we're living this, we're, we're working this in a mode of belief. Um, I think there, uh, I know there can often be sometimes a, 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 like a first thought of like, do they really believe this? Like, is this really what the truth is? Um, and also, uh, um, are they uh, like, I think sometimes people will join a church looking for someone to tell them what is the what is the actual truth what is the what is the actual myth like or not not even what's the myth like how was the world actually created that kind of thing um they, they want to be given uh a, a clear answer and one thing that i've often noticed spending my time in the ajc is that the there that answer is usually like um well it depends and also generally like uh here's here's how we approach it but your interpretation of it might be different so I guess, uh, Sean, I'd love for you to just engage a little bit with like, so we've talked a lot about that myth, but then, but at the same time, you've you, like back in that last episode and, uh, and I think here you, you're often talking about how that, how it is a myth, like it, um, and myth versus fact. Uh, can you, can you maybe get into a little of why it's important not to tell people coming into a church or just coming into anything? Uh, here's what truth is. Here's what correct is. Can you maybe get into what the the value? Uh, the explain the value of not telling people what to believe. Well, I think you know the. Hmm. I mean, you know, you're 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 dealing because we're a Gnostic church, you know, and as I mentioned in you know part one, I mean, the very foundation of Gnosis and Gnosticism is the idea of one's own individual spiritual experience right in order to encounter gnosis in order to encounter gnosticism um, you have to encounter experience and particularly you have to encounter your own experience everything that we have whether you take the canonical you know canonical scripture in the form of you know the hebrew bible or the greek new testament um, the nag Hammadi, the corpus hermeticum they are all the products and you know results in flowering of the experience of other people and that there's a degree of importance there right i mean you know we're not you know the purpose isn't to take their experience as our own the purpose is to have our own so if the purpose is to have our own experience why do we bother with the accounts or results of other people's experience right look at it this way right you take a tuning fork you strike it you hold it next to you've got the and you've got the tone going you hold it next to uh, uh another tuning fork <coughs> and the second tuning fork is is going to vibrate right it's what we call resonance and this is why we read stories this is why we explore myth this is why we create 
um, you know, and read and share poetry, right? Not because it gives us experience we don't we don't have or is designed to to give us somebody else's experience of our own but rather it's designed to draw out or bring out our own experience it gives us the language it gives us the symbols it gives us the means to communicate the experience to the ineffable in in our in our own life and in order to do that in order to have a community where that happens you know you need to not drill down and and define and delineate everything you need to create a space in which somebody can see themselves in which they can participate in which they can have and share and reflect and exchange with their own experience with their own experience um and with another's uh, experience right if you fell you know it's much like you know i guess the Lur lurianic the lurianic Kabbalistic idea of the Zimzum that God at the beginning of, of the the universe so-called <clears throat> withdraws a portion of itself in order to have a space in which it creates in which it can create right so you have this contraction of the divine in order to have a space in which the universe can can be created right so the idea of a community the idea of this particular community you know is is to create a space where you know collectively we retract our collectively and individually to a certain degree we contract ourselves a bit in order to have a space for you know the individual to respond and have you know their their own experience myth and, and story and legend and liturgy and ritual you know and and scripture is is important because it helps give people language they might not have it helps give them perspective and mirrors that they might not have um, into that experience and and a way to talk about it and, and a way to share it gives you the ability to communicate what is otherwise incommunicable right i mean you know like i said i think in you know in the in the in the in the, in the first part you know uh, myth is true without being factual right there's a difference between something that is true and something uh, that is factual and it doesn't have to be factual in order to have a, a an element of of truth behind it right uh you know the tortoise the tortoise and hare tells us that you know slow and steady wins the race and that's not because there was an actual tortoise and an actual hare um you know having a race uh, you know a foot race at some point in, in some time yet at the same time it tells us something that is true about our condition and, and true about the path of life right so you have this you have this particular legend on which the ajc you know and its predecessor organization um you know the primitive church from faber palafrat turns you know and this stuff this stuff is myth and, and legend and it tells it tells us something true about uh, you know who we are you know who we'd like to be and the 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 concepts and the the principles and the and the spiritual flame from from which we come from right i mean you know myth you know history is what tells you about the path myth myth is what tells you about who you are and about the future right and so for us you know it's about having you know enough of those things enough of the historical mythological you know and and spiritual touchstones to kind of form a, a common ground and a common language something that enables people to meet and communicate um you know in a world where they wouldn't necessarily you know be able to do um you know otherwise but not in such a way that it dominates or it takes over their experience or becomes simply uh you know replacing one literalism uh for for another you know you ha you have to leave room for you know the spiritual experience of the individual because that's the only way you're going to get the spiritual experience of the community because one is made from the other yeah, yeah. no Does I, that think that's, <laughs> I think that's an awesome summation thank you um well with that said uh maybe we can dive back into history basically we left at the end of the last episode uh talking about the myths and legends around the Templar order that Fabre Palaprat, or sorry, I just said Fabre Palaprat, Fabre Palaprat established in the early 19th century. So, can, can you tell us, you know, some of the specifics of, uh, about this Templar order? Like, how did it work? Like, did it have degrees? Uh, did it allow women? Did you have to be rich and connected to join? Like, do you know anything about what they what they actually taught and like encouraged well, and told members to do? 
that question changed. I mean, that que- obviously, you know, we know that, you know, any answer to a comparative question with our own lives is going to change based on what point in time in which, you know, you, you ask it, right. You know, me, who I, you know, what I believe and what I do with that belief is going to be different when I'm 18, you know, when I'm 35, when I'm 45 and, and when I'm 70. And so to a certain degree, um, that's true of Faber Palaprat. But if we can kind of take a look at kind of the end result of their history, right, because it did develop over time, um, you know, this essentially their, uh, you know, based, and we have documents that kind of testify to this stuff from, from different points in time. There, there are records from the 1810s, the 1820s, and stuff from, from the 1830s, and you get slightly different answers the further you go because those answers are responses to conditions on the ground we can only we can only kind of look or read between uh uh you know the lines to to get the the kind of context i mean remember you know the the christian creeds weren't uh christian creeds weren't a statement about what people believed at the time they were a statement about what people didn't believe the reason why they had to say what they did believe was in order to separate themselves out from the people who they didn't agree with Right. And so, you know, it's much like, you know, the idea of when you see Christian condemnations of magic, it means Christians were widely practicing magic enough in order to condemn it. Right. So so some of these some of these beliefs and ideas may be responses to conditions on the ground to a certain degree. We don't know. But basically their you know, their Templar order started off essentially as a as, you know, what they saw as the literal continuation of the medieval Templar order with knights and and nobles and, you know, and grandmasters and, you know, the idea of, you know, defending, uh, you know, person, property, livelihood and principle. And as they go on, of course, and as they develop their own kind of uh, working, you know, both the foundational myth, but also working with that foundational myth, it begins to take on a a spiritual quality. And, And, you know, 10 years into its existence, that's where the the Joannite Church, um, you know, comes into play, and then you essentially you have the Templar Order and the Joannite Church um, working in tandem and also influencing each other. So, in terms of the the mundane operation on the ground, though, they were, you know, they were surprising surprisingly ahead of their time. And depending on which parts of the world or even parts of the country you go to today, they are still ahead of their time. Um, you know, you didn't have to be rich, you know, you could be uh, a woman, you didn't have to be uh, uh, a Freemason. They basically, um, to to talk about the structure, you know, you have to divide it up into into several parts, right? The Templar Order is its own entity, and then you have the church. And on the Templar Order side of things, there were basically two parts. They did have a Masonic Lodge style system, um, which essentially, you know, they called lodges or houses of initiation. Um, which had a series of degrees, and most of them had, you know, uh, uh, five, five or six degrees. Um, they also had kind of what they called convents or abbeys, and these weren't really convents or abbeys. They were more like lodges that admitted women, right? Okay. Um, uh, at least the, the convents were basically their houses of initiation um, that were open to women, though there's nothing to suggest that their their lodges proper, their houses of initiation, um, didn't also allow women because apparently it did, but they divided these essentially groups or communities into several different types, uh, lodges, abbeys, convents, uh, those kind of things. And so you had an initiatory lodge style uh, uh, degree system, uh, much like you would with with Freemasonry, um, you know, within the Templar order. But once you got beyond that system, that's where you actually got into what we would recognize now as a kind of modern order of chivalry where you had uh you know uh, squires and knights and dames where that connects to the church um is that they had a bunch between the church and the templar order they had intertwining offices so the templar order had bishops or more specifically uh primates and the church had knights right so some of these things were well, when the church came along some of these things became uh interchangeable and both of them were based on that same fundamental uh lineage that templar lineage larminius lineage um and uh of course the the legend 
Now, once the Templar Order and the Joannite Church began working in, in tandem, then they begin, began dividing their kind of common offices. For example, both the, the Order and the Church had knights, but the Templar Order were basically considered the, the secular knights, while the Joannite Church knights were considered ecclesiastical knights. And the ecclesiastical knights, the religious knights, were considered hierarchically to be superior um, to the, the uh, secular knights. So they had, and, and where all these, these things moved, you know, kind of in parallel, side by side, working in tandem, common offices, common roles, common degrees, and where they meet, of course, is at the top, because the Grand Master, the Sovereign Grand Man Master of the Templar Order, is also the Sovereign Pontiff and Patriarch of, of the, the Joannite Church. So where the structure meets is actually in the, the uh, you know, the, the upper offices, but at least for the, the, for, the, for the first bit or for the bulk of the structure, they seem to run in parallel. Um, is that the kind of answer or detail you're looking for? Yeah, yeah, that, that's it exactly. Okay. And uh, and can you tell us a, a little bit about the, the, we'll be talking about the church soon about but what the order wanted people to do? Like, can you tell us a little bit about spiritual chivalry and you know how how this might be connected to even our modern uh, focus on the AJC with helping people? Well, I mean, that's the you know there's a common thing, and you know, and I mentioned before, you know, I mentioned the I made the 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 reference to you know uh, as one storyteller you know, referred to taking that reference of Celtic Christianity, where the Old Testament of Celtic Christianity was nature and a relationship with the, with the land, right? The, so the Old Testament, using that analogy, you know, the, the, the Old Testament of, of Palaprat, you know, was this idea of the, of the Templars or spiritual uh, chivalry, and that kind of informs everything they do. Another part of that kind of Old Testament or that foundational assumption on which their then present day activity is built, of course, is the structure of Freemasonry, the bulk of the people who who found and participate and organize these things are, are are Freemasons, and you know Freemasonry, of course, has running through its entire history, you know the you know the ideas of fraternity, you know of charity, of what Palaprat would call you know uh, dedication or devotion to the common parenthood of of all humanity, right? I mean Freemasonry calls it you know the something along the lines of the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man, right? Uh, uh, you know, Palaprat, I think, takes this a little bit, you know, a little bit more of a, of a spiritual direction. So you have these things that are basically the foundational myth or assumptions or principles or axis mundi, perhaps, um, around which the, you know, the, the Templar order um, is concerned. They weren't simply just, from what I can tell, you know, they weren't simply just you know collecting titles and and medals and you know meeting for for dinner they were they were designed to um you know teach and really ingrain and integrate um uh, you know actual principles into you know much like freemasonry intends to do uh you know the freemasonry you know mainstream freemasonry says to make good men better and you know this templar order you know has has the idea essentially to make good people better and specifically how they're talking about making people better is specifically within the context and the principles of the legend because they're templars right so if you know templar history you know you're you're dealing with an order that essentially you know is is struck down you know in the medieval era by a variety of historical social and spiritual factors right you know uh what they believe of course is a potentially corrupt church uh, you know, a greedy state in the form of its, you know, monarch, and of course, you know, uh, an intolerant, uh, uh, you know, populace. How this translates into these the foundational assumptions of of the Templar era, era is that you know they're they're taking on the duty and vocation vocation of being, um, you know, knights and priests with the idea of, you know, helping your fellow humanity, resisting superstition all these other kind of things. So, you know, the context in the legend by which they see themselves as historically having been beaten down, their recreation or refoundation is to fight those forces in society, essentially, in, in the present day, at least as I understand their their orientation, right? Their, their idea is for a more rational, a more sane, a more uh, fraternal approach to the concept of 
you know, uh, chivalry and knighthood, you know, not for, you know, warfare on the, on the, uh, the battlefield, but, you know, the, the warfare of character being, of being better people, right? So you, you, you look at the historical, uh, you know, social and spiritual forces that brought down the original Templars, and they take those as the things to be, you know, on guard against, uh, you know, in their present day in, in post-revolutionary France. So that's kind of why they're, you know, why they're why they're doing that, uh, um, you know, the the way they do. And of course, when you translate that into the church terms for their Jonah Church, their 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 you know uh, primitive church is that they're they're taking that same kind of historical impulse that sum of positive and, and negatives and they're working that you know in the in in a similar fashion you know for for them the church of john is superior to the church of of peter and and the reason why you know the the church of peter is inferior in their mind is just look at the results of history and see where that's gotten so their idea is to create a more esoteric a more internal a more spiritual a more, uh, you know, principled, uh, you know, church uh, to kind of restore that and to bring that back in the in the in the present day, um, precisely by you know not being not being versions of their exoteric counterparts. Basically, does that uh, does that help? That's perfect. So we've mentioned a few times that that the order comes first, then the church develops, and then they're sort of hand in hand. But it's my understanding, or a lot of sources say that the something that inspired the formation of the church was the discovery of the Leviticon. Uh, mm -hmm. I hope someday, uh, the behind the scenes, I can't reveal too much. Uh, His Eminence and I and others have been doing some very interesting research on the Leviticon. It's probably going to be some time yet, but hopefully we'll have a, a mini-series about that on this channel. But before we can get to that, Your Eminence, what is the Leviticon? Well, um, first, there's, I think there's got to be a definition of terms, right? I mean, yeah. You know, now, you know, depending on parts of the, you know, parts of North America that you, you go to, I mean, you know, the, um, you know, Coke is a generic term for all kind of pop or soda pop, right? Much in the same way that Kleenex has become the term for all tissue. So Leviticon has kind of become, you know, the term that we use to refer to the Gospel of John used by the Joanite Church in the Templar Order, but that's not actually accurate. We use it as a as a shorthand because the real thing is a bit of a mouthful. So the Leviticon is actually um, is actually a compilation of of documents of which the Gospel of John is is part of it. So uh, the Leviticon is essentially the the kind of foundational manual catechisms. Uh, ritual and scripture of both the primitive church, as Pat called it. We've been calling it the Joanite Church, uh, but they called it the primitive church. That's important to note. Or the, you know, Eglise decree, the 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 Church of Christ, uh, the primitive Church of Christ. So the Leviticon is is essentially kind of the the master work that contains the catechisms, um, the ordinations. Uh, the lineage, the documents, the the scriptures, and the governing documents for the Joanite Church and and part of the the Templar Order for the past you know 100 150 years. When most people say the Leviticon, what they really mean is the version of the Gospel of John. But the Gospel of John, the primitive version of the Gospel of John, or the supposed unedited or secret version of the Gospel of John, is actually only one part, about half of the documents of the Leviticon. So the Leviticon is actually a series of documents and not simply uh, one document alone. Yeah. No, thank you. Oh, <laughs> we got, we have some, we have a cameo. Um, yeah, cameo, cameo by my puppy. Yeah. No, I got to say, and I would say something like 90% of what people mean by the Leviticon is this, this alternate version of the Gospel of John. It's usually what I mean when I use it, but I, I'm really glad that you have that clarification because there is, there is a lot of, uh, you know, we don't have time to get into it, but uh, if you Google about the Leviticon, you'll see all sorts of claims about it, and there's all sorts of modern myths about it, and there's people who say things that aren't in there about it. So I recommend uh, getting a copy. That, I mean, we don't have the entire thing translated, as his evidence is saying, but we have the alternate version of the Gospel of John, the, the church has published yeah. one. I'll link it up uh, below. Okay, we, so this... We, there, and there's a reason why we publish that stuff first and, and not, you know, not the other stuff, right? I mean... 
Um, you know, and there is lots of stuff we have that we simply just haven't, you know, we haven't gotten around to because, you know, the AJC, much like your beloved hosts of, of Talknosis, are all volunteers. They all work in other work in other fields and, and, and they do stuff. So, you know, it's a matter of, of, you know, placing our resources and time where, you know, where we, where it can be the most effective. And we thought the most effective thing at the time to do um, was to work on the primitive gospels rather, you know, rather than, you know, uh, you know, the documents they give to an ordained deacon or, or you know, the canon law of Bernard Raymond Faber Prattle church at the time. The thing that's actually going to be useful is the thing that you can actually use out in the world. And, and, uh, and we thought the primitive gospel um, was, was the best use of that time. So that's why, that's why we led with that. Exactly. So uh, I'm probably going to say this this word right. If or sorry, I'm probably going to say this word wrong. If you know how to say it right, uh, please do. But but what is uh, Galicianism, Gallicanism, and and the Church and the Order seem to be like a big deal for some time. So sorry, this is a two part question. So what is uh, Gallicanism and the Church and the Order seem to be a big deal for some time? Like that they're not a small hidden group or quirky. And like I understood that the Napoleonic government let them have a big mass for De, Mo De Mole in one of the largest churches in Paris, and then loaned them a contingent of soldiers for for a parade in Paris. So if you can tell us a, a little bit about all that. Well, that's a whole lot of different things. Um, <laughs> you know, the uh, uh, well, I think you know, much in the same way where I've talked about Templarism as kind of being, you know, the the backdrop or the orientation point, the magnetic pole of you know the spiritual impulse of the Templar Order and the Joanite Church, and how that composite in turn is is kind of the foundation point for for ourselves. Um, uh, in the present day, right? I mean, it's important to understand the, you know, the the historical context, right? Because I mean, you know, I've mentioned history tells you about the past, myth tells you about who you can be, right? And so there's a reason why. And if if you if if folks at home have listened to the first part, I told the story about my grandpa and Louis Riel, right? I mean, it isn't just what the myths say that tell us about, you know, who we are or what's important or what the future might look like, what the ideal or those kind of things might look like. Um, why we choose the myths and stories we do um, tells you something both about who we were, who we are and who we can be, right? I mean, it isn't just story, it's also why we choose those things. And, you know, so you have, you have the Templar Order and the Joanite Church, you know, as, as, you know, as being, you know, guardians against superstition, as supporters of, rationality and spiritual principle and all these other kind of things but those things don't arrive you know out of nowhere there's a reason why they chose those myths why they enacted those things and of course there's a societal context to that and this connects to the wider history of france and the wider history of, of christianity and, and catholicism in specific so gallicanism essentially i mean it gets its name obviously gallican comes from from gaul which of course is the you know the the you know the ancient name for you know the bulk of france basically um and uh you know so it's kind of a movement kind of named after that region and essentially what it refers to is basically the idea of um national i want to say nationalistic and by nationalistic i don't mean nationalistic as in nationalism right um you know but basically nation based uh, is how i'm using the term so you know a nation based kind of administration or centricity in in church government the idea you know for for you know for the for the bulk of christian history right you have certain centers that have been kind of the dominant forces of Christianity, you know, the patriarchs of Jerusalem, Constantinople, you know, the Bishop of Rome, the, the Pope, and particularly, um, you know, in the last thousand years, but, you know, particularly at the height of the Templar, the original Templars, the Templar age, right, and, you know, the high Middle Ages, um, you know, 12th to 14th century type of thing, you not only have, you know, spiritual, you know, total spiritual control by the Bishop of Rome, you have to a certain degree the height of temporal uh, papal power where, you know, the Pope is asserting itself as, you know, being higher than kings and actually responsible for the spiritual authority of kings, the ability to set up and depose kings, the ability, uh, you know, to solely, you know, invest bishops, all those kind of things. And those, those things play out in a series of historical spats of going back and forth 
you know, you have Henry the the fourth and and Pope Gregory, um, you know, and and Canossa and being out in the snow, kneeling for for days on end in order to bring the 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 you know the 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 one of the kings of the day to to heal under the authority of the Pope, um, and you also have you know probably the most powerful Pope um, that ever lived, Pope Innocent the the third. So you know the idea that the papacy wields not wields not only spiritual p- power but temporal power and superior. Um, to the kings and queens of the earth at the time. So Gallicanism essentially is is an idea to take the church, um, you know, back or outside of that power structure, right? That that the church in a given country has has the well in union with well in spiritual union with Rome. That you know a national church, for example, the Catholic Church in France, you know, should have you know administrative or governance governing independence. Um, from Rome. So uh, basically, you know, the idea that nations are, um, you know, uh, more or less independent branches of churches rather than, you know, subsumed strictly under one head. I mean, obviously, they're not going to disconnect themselves from from the, uh, you know, the Bishop of Rome, but essentially, you know, they're, they're asserting, for example, that the, the Church of France, you know, while in union in Rome, you know, has the right to, uh, 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 govern itself more more directly, and so particularly because Gallicanism, of course, you know, is not only this idea of independence, but it literally takes the name from from where it's at. Um, obviously, the Gauls were the biggest proponents of Gallicanism, right? Um, you know, because there's that 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 uh, connection in there. So that idea of more uh, more independence, you know, of the French Church, you know, from the Roman Church for for governance perspective um, was already in the air. And in fact, it, it comes and goes. Historically, it's been a thing between France and Rome, and it has a particular high point uh, around the, the point in time of the, the French Revolution. And if anything, those two aims dovetail, right? Because essentially in the French Revolution, you know, have the monarchy being overthrown. And you have, you have essentially, you know, not just the monarchy, but a whole what they would call it society in a state or in a cl- or a class that's being overthrown and that's you know the monarchy the nobility the clerical state um you know that kind of thing you know in favor of the people now they didn't want to get rid of christianity as such they wanted to change it to be you know uh you know much like the the palaprat stuff more more rational less super less superstitious more more age of enlightenment um you know that type of stuff so when the monarchy's getting overthrown, you know, functionally so is the church, but they're not getting rid of the church. They ended up, um, you know, in accordance with, uh, they essentially take Gallicanism one step further and they end up creating what is functionally a separate church. There's something um, that was created as a part of the French Revolution called the Civil Constitution of the Clergy, which basically uh, essentially creates a state Catholic church with its own bishops, its own priests, its own parishes, um, and whatnot, and it's essentially um, Catholicism completely detached from, completely detached from Rome. So you already have people who have a certain degree of kind of a push and pull tug of war relationship with the idea of Rome. That whenever Rome kind of turns its back just a little bit, France as an independent kind of Christian entity or church kind of asserts its own thing, puffs out its chest and says, you know, we're we're our own thing. And this kind of um, while not necessarily, you know, directly connected, there's many, many, many indirect uh, connections to say that the, you know, the civil constitution of the clergy, as I understand it, was more or less the the apex of Gallicanism manifest because they essentially made their own state church. And in fact, some of the biggest, uh, you know, Roman Catholic proponents of Gallicanism end up going on to become the first clergy in the the state church. Um, you know, there's a guy by the name of uh, uh, Abbe Grégoire, um, you know, who is a well-known bishop of the day, Roman Catholic bishop, um, who goes on to be the first person to uh, take the the civil oath of the civil constitution of the clergy. Essentially, you know, he becomes the first state cleric. And, uh, and it's Abbe Grégoire who in turn, con- who consecrates um the bishop that will go on to consecrate Faber Palaprat. So there is a direct uh connection to these things. And Palaprat himself is consecrated uh, a bishop 
by the bishop of uh, by the bishop of Haiti, if I remember correct, off the top of my head, the civil bishop of Haiti. Remember the civil constitution. Though they call it constitutional bishop. So now at this point, you have kind of parallel hierarchies. You have a Roman Catholic hierarchy, and you have what they call the constitutional hierarchy or the constitutional uh, bishops. So they basically create their own uh, parallel uh, state church. And so the first people to to take the oath and become uh, clergy of the state are the people who are directly connected to and responsible for ordaining uh, many of the figures involved with Palaprat's Templar order and church. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and uh, sorry, in my question about the um, sort of the Napoleonic government and, and the uh, embracing or seemingly embracing or celebrating the, the Templar uh, yes. order and church. Yeah. yeah. Well, and see, this is where you have, you know, this is where you have kind of mutual interest, mutual aid, you know, aligned, uh, whatever, where, you know, people here, you know, you know, they, they basically all the parties involved have their own aims and their own goals, and they realize that they're traveling in the same direction, right? So, you know, you have, you have the constitutional clergy, and, you know, and essentially the, the, the Gallicanism inspired folks who want to assert their independence versus they want to they want to continue the church, but they want to assert their independence, um, you know, of their own church uh, versus Rome. And functionally, you have Napoleon wanting to do more or less the you know the 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 same thing, right? I mean, you know, uh, Napoleon has upended the the you know the the order. He goes from being you know first consul, first citizen, you know that type of thing in a in a kind of I don't want to say parody because it's it's not quite as vulgar of that but in, in in imitation of other things where you have you know a first among equals governor who decides to drop the veil to a certain degree and all of a sudden you know the 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 you know the the dictator a smoother historical uh, version for which you know napoleon would be a kind of imitator of course would be um you know uh, octavian augustus caesar right um only augustus did a better job of I think historically maintaining the fiction, he also lasted longer than 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 Napoleon did. But uh, Augustus maintained the, the the fiction of the Republic a little bit longer um, than Napoleon did. So Napoleon has you know um, you know basically set himself up as emperor, you know, and um, you know in a mark to not only his kind of aspirations and kind of what he sees as as the the independence and, and character of France um, and also a, a rejection of the fact that you know anybody from outside France has authority over France um, that instead of being crowned by the Pope as you know recent centuries would have you know popes crowning heads of state that kind of thing instead of being crowned by a bishop or being crowned by a Pope Napoleon puts the crown on his own head right and so you see Napoleon you know, taking the state in the same direction that you have, you know, the Gallicans wanting to take the church, for example, the idea of asserting their, their, their independence or coming out from under the, the thumb of Rome. And you realize that these two, these two aims align and support each other, right? They're mutually supporting narratives in that, in that present day, right? You know, that, that essentially, uh, you know, Napoleon recognizes that there's, there are these folks that are essentially, you know, want to create or have functionally created, you know, an independent church that retains, you know, that retains all the good things uh, without the governance or, or uh, uh, oversight from outside. And this is more or less, you know, what, uh, you know, Napoleon wants to do with the state by the idea of putting the crown on his own head. And so, you know, it's, it's convenient, you know, uh, you know, independent empire, independent church. Right. And uh, and so, you know, he sees the idea, uh, I would think. And I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm taking it. I'm taking a guess here. But, you know, I'm filling in these blanks based on events that actually happened in, in history. It is possible that we have the wrong interpretation of it. But the conclusion, you know, that I draw is that one of the reasons why Napoleon supported um, the primitive ch church and supported uh, Though actually, I would say the Joanite Church came a little bit later than Napoleon, so that that that's a historical error to say that Napoleon supported the church as such. Napoleon supported the the Templar order because that's more contemporary to Napoleon's time, because he didn't last forever, you know, when the church came about later. But um, you know that 
you know, it looks to me as if, I mean, essentially that Napoleon supported um, the Order of the Temple of Faber Palaprat precisely because they had aligned aims, you know, where esta establishing or reviving, you know, an independent, you know, patriotic, self-governing, you know, entity was concerned. Um, and so he, you know, he, he basically took steps to support them and recognize them in ways that are actually quite uh, astonishing. I mean, you know, and, and this is one of those things that clearly kind of mark out the fact that the Templar order at the time and Faber Palaprat wasn't just some fringe dudes in some, in some back room. I mean, you know, he gave them uh, official support, you know, in the form of, you know, allowing, uh, you know, official ceremonies, official parade, you know, official days. Um, and they were allowed to, uh, they were allowed to display their orders. There's a, there's a certain thing in kind of, you know, modern, well, semi-modern, I mean, historical aristocratic circles and knighthood and orders of, of chivalry where there are, there are orders or groups or communities that are recognized and those that aren't, right? Like, for example, you know, if you're, you know, if you're, uh, you know, if you're attending a function with the, you know, with, with Queen Elizabeth, um, you know, you and, and you are a knight of, uh, you, and you are a knight, for example, you know, in the, in the United Kingdom, well, you're allowed to wear the things that designate that. But, you know, if you received a, a knighthood or a noble title or an official thing from, you know, another nation that wasn't, you know, recognized by the crown or any of those kind of things, or wasn't seen as legitimate, you wouldn't be allowed to to wear those, uh, you know, in their presence as a matter of diplomacy, because it Im implies a degree of support or de degree of recognition or a relationship that doesn't exist. And so Napoleon allowed um, this order of knights to wear their regalia and to wear their medals, basically, um, you know, in his presence and as a part of state functions, um, basically designated that, that they were considered as uh, legitimate and official uh, from the perspective of the state. Yeah. Which is pretty damn significant. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we're going to finally kind of get into what what Palaprat's church uh, believed or, or taught. So, so I often hear it referred to as a Gnostic church. When was a Gnostic in the in the way that you know Sophia and the Demiurge and the Aeons and the sort of stuff that we find in the Nag Hammadi texts uh, are all present? Can, can you tell us a, a bit about you know in, in what ways it may be Gnostic or ways it may not be Gnostic? Actually, well, before sorry, but before we dive into the theology, because I'm I'm interested in that answer, but I also want to uh, I, I sort of felt myself get intrigued by the history, by the Napoleonic history stuff there. Uh, but I, I would love either to hear what value that brings back into it, or if like, if it is just, these are some interesting um, areas around which this theology developed, but like, just to help uh, help me frame everything we just heard into into that kind of, into that narrative. The, so why, why you know, the why does it matter of the Napoleon half of the coin? Yeah, like well, cause, because there's a lot of crunchy stuff there, but not necessarily like uh, spiritual stuff there, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, just just help me help me connect that. It, well, I don't know that the Napoleon end of it has a has a spiritual thing beyond, I guess, if you were to say kind of a, a nationalistic or a patriotic spirit, right? I mean, the idea that you know those, you know, that those principles resonated you know, not just in the, not just in the, in the lower rungs. And I mean that they, I mean that they resonated in the lower rungs is obvious because it's the lower rungs that overthrew the higher rungs. It's how you get the French revolution. It's how you get the upending of, of, of society and all this stuff, but that those principles maintaining, maintaining or carrying that spirit into the, into the new state and in the, in, into the new era is kind of um, foundational things. I mean, you know, well, obviously, um, you know, it wasn't like Palaprat was made a member of the cabinet or anything, but there's, but there's, a, there's a, there's a certain thing where it says, you know, that those, um, that those principles or ideas are, you know, um, were not fringe. They, 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 they resonated with common people and noble people alike. Does that, does that help? I think so. Um, and I think maybe there's also something I'm maybe also connecting to here is that, uh, um, 
it's also useful, I think, maybe to, to get a sense of the, the 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 context from which a lot of these like uh, semi Masonic um, like uh, where where the like the ideals that lead Palaprat to where he comes from are part of that that whole environment. And so I'm just uh, yeah, I'm just kind of finding I'm even expressing for myself a way to, to tie it all together. Yeah, I think in order to really kind of you know get at the at the bedrock of thing, I think ultimately the the best kind of you know the best kind of to to look at the principles, right? I mean, you know, to to get a sense of the principles and where they come from. I mean, you would look at you would look at a combination of things. You would look at the origins of Freemasonry. You would look at the roots of the Age of Enlightenment, um, you know, and the philosophers around and, and prior to the French Revolution, that type of thing. I mean, that's that's what's in the air and, and you know, in the water. Um, and these things are, you know, kind of distilled down into the more specific kind of historical manifest. Manif that's, that's how, you know, the Templar Order, the Joanite Church, the Napoleon thing, that's how these people take these things out into the world. I, I okay. may be giving Napoleon a little bit too much credit because also um, naked power was <laughs> also his thing. You just, you can dress it up in a whole bunch of other things, you know, fraternity, liberty, egality, right? All, all these kind of, you know, revolution and post-revolutional stuff. I mean, there was a power vacuum. Oh, look, I'll step into it. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, sorry. I just felt like I, I wanted oh, to no, to help <laughs> help anybody listening who's like, why have we been talking about Napoleon and all this stuff to just get a get a bit of a, a way to anchor yeah. this in. Yeah. All well, right. So yes, go oh, ahead, John. Oh, oh, all right, diving diving back into what the what the, the dogma of the church or what the church taught or or didn't teach. I often see it listed as a Gnostic church eminence. Is is a Gnostic uh, yes. in that way that a lot yeah. of us think of, right? With those elaborate mythologies, with those characters of Nag Hammadi, all that good stuff. It's not Gnostic. It's it's not explicitly Gnostic. I would say the, the primitive church is not Gnostic in the same way that Led Zeppelin isn't playing the blues, mm -hmm. right? You know, you have those things, and, you know, those things, I've probably used the phrase in the air or in the water more times than I've said anything else during these conversations. I mean, these are the foundational assumptions. These are the things that go into it. There, There is definitely, they don't use the term Gnostic, but there are, there are definitely beliefs or ideas or practices for what we know now. And they didn't have the Nag Hammadi in their time, right? I mean, you, you have some surviving texts and things that, you know, that are more or less a part or in the orbit of the, the corpus that were, you know, uh, around, you know, in the 19th century, you know, I think stuff like the Pista Sophia or whatever, but the kind of detail and fine grain that you have in, in the Nag Hammadi for what kind of defines or shape, shapes what we know of classical Gnosticism, they didn't have access to that in, in Palaprat's time. Um, you know, all they had essentially are the surviving bits of whatever was written by the church fathers and the heresiologists of the time. And some of those things aren't necessarily accurate and where they are accurate, they're still presented with, um, you know, a, a bit of a, a agenda. I mean, they chose those quotes and those things to look at for a reason. It isn't just the story that tells the story, it's how the how you tell the story that tells the story, right? And so the same thing is, is true about historical Gnosticism in our day and their day and in, in the original day. So I wouldn't I wouldn't call them explicitly Gnostic and they never they never used the term. Not even once that I can see did they they use the term. However, they have a couple ideas that are um, you know, ahead of their time for what we know now uh, as uh, uh, Gnosticism that I think even if they aren't explicitly Gnostic, they're shared in common with uh, Gnostic, Gnosticism. And some of those those ideas essentially, for example, you know, uh, you have in, in some of the classic texts, as I recall, and this is the, I, I'm surprised this is the first time I'm saying it in like an hour and a half worth of overall recording. Um, I am not a scholar, okay? <laughs> um, you know, I'm a priest and a, and a practitioner. Please d defer to scholars on this. Um, you know, but you have some of the ideas that you find, for example, in classic Gnostic texts, for example, Sabine stuff, uh, like the Secret Book of John, you, you, have, uh, you have allusion or fundamental references to the idea of, and I'm gonna butcher this Greek, like I butcher everything else. Hell, I butcher the English language, uh, apocryphal stasis right the idea more or less a big fancy term for universal salvation the idea that in the end you know uh, all will be saved or all will be 
reintegrated or resolved the fundamental fall or condition of the universe, however you define that mythologically, cosmology, uh, you know, or individually, that uh, the things that need fixing will get fixed and all people will will come to it. It isn't it isn't that, uh, you know, there'll be some people left behind or some people damned forever that it, that in good time, whether independent of whether or not people believe in this life only or the idea of heaven or the idea of rebirth, blah, 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 independent of all that stuff, that all things in the end will be resolved into the divine universal salvation, basically that uh, everybody's end is, is functionally uh, a good one. You find those, um, you know, you find those ideas in like the qualified dualism or perhaps qualified monism, for example, of the, of the, you know, of the secret book of John that, you know, at the end of the story where the individual is concerned um, is a good one. They will be in time, however long that takes and however winding it is, um, they will in the end be saved. And this is, this is, uh, you know, this is an idea that you find, um, you know, particularly in some, uh, you know, early Gnostic sects. And it's also uh, an idea that you find implied in some early church fathers who later on would have fallings out with, with the church, you know, in the patristic area, for example, people like uh, Origen of, of Alexandria. So it's not complete, it's not the dominion of Gnosticism itself. There are elements of it in what we would call proto-Orthodox Christianity as well. But at any rate, the, the idea falls into disfavor. It doesn't necessarily start off as a, a as a heresy, but it certainly uh, you know gets uh, you know treated as one throughout the bulk of Christian history. And so this is something that when Polycrates Church comes around, this is something that they believe adamantly that um, uh, you know that everybody that everybody would be saved. So I I count that. Uh, and I mean, and that's that's kind of the reverse or you know implicit version of the cosmology of emanations, right? Um, you know that everything extends or ripples out from a source, and that ultimately it'll return to it. So I think that I think you know, well, they're not emanation as as, as such. I think their universalism, uh, you know, uh, their their universalism or universal uh, 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 salvation kind of speaks or overlaps or kind of shadows a kind of Gnostic sense of things without explicitly using the terms uh, Gnostic or Gnosis. The other thing that I would I would consider um, to be interesting of them, particularly of their time, um, you know, that seems to be part and partial for modern Gnosticism and also has ripples in ancient Gnosticism, um, is they had wildly different, there wasn't a, you know, a hard fast orthodox view on Christ, the Logos, or or Jesus, whether or not all those things are connected, whether they're parallel, whether they're talking about the same being or not, whether one extends from the other, whether Jesus became Christ at some point in time, those those kind of things. That's something that they they leave up to the individual conscience. And in this regard, they're not using they're not using the term experience. But I think when you look at the Thalaprat material. Um, and you read or you see things talking about the individual conscience, what you can really read is the individual experience. And in that there, I would say they're, they're pretty damn Gnostic without using the term. Like I said, they never use the term, right? You know, they're, they're not, uh, you know, they're not trying to create a alternative, uh, you know, parallel Christian, Christianity or a different religion. They're trying to return Christianity to its own roots. So they're not seeing themselves as a departure from Christianity. They're seeing themselves as Christianity in its purest form. And uh, so they're not defining, they're not defining themselves as being heretics. They're defining everybody else as being heretics to a certain degree, um, yeah. though they're not antagonistic like that. They're not necessarily making proclamations or saying that other people are evil or doing wrong. They're just saying that they essentially they want to return the church and Christianity to its primitive, to it, it, its pure state. And this is by, you know, encouraging certain doctrines that they felt were Christianity in its, its purest and original form, being, you know, um, ideas of universal salvation, um, Christ as a matter of individual con conscience. Um, the pre-existence of the human soul, for example, that, you know, much like, uh, you know, much like the divine is eternal, that human beings are a part of the eternal, um, you know, and, and uh, as a result, you know, pre-exist our, our present uh, lifetimes. So you have that in, they also have kind of a, 
you know, implied chain of being, which, you know, of course, when, you know, you, the popularizer of chain of being, of course, is Neoplatonic ideas and other things that extend from them, like, uh, you know, Kabbalistic ideas and whatnot. Um, so they have a lot of ideas that are very Gnostic-ish and very esoteric-ish um, without, uh, without using those terms, I guess, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. No, and, and for those who have uh, more of a, a secular background or um, don't have a Christian background or a Christian historical background, it, it doesn't really seem to be that big of a deal. But leaving the nature of Christ, beliefs about the nature of Christ up to the believer is, is a huge deal when it comes to Christianity. Maybe maybe yeah. not so much more of our more modern churches, but that's what Christians love to argue about the last 2,000 years. Is he man? Is he God? Is he half man? Is he half God? In what ways is he half man and half God? The, was he born god yada yada the nature the nature the nature of christ and the definition of the nature of christ and the questions any of the questions revolving around jesus or christ or the logos is so important to the idea of orthodoxy or not and the the fundamental path of christianity is so foundational to christianity i mean number one it's in the bloody name right christianity so you know christ Every single ecumenical council, every single thing that decided what the church believes and what it doesn't, every major schism of note, every major thing of note, um, you know, the seven ecumenical councils, the, 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 the great schism, you know, 10, 1054 or 56 or whatever it is. I mean, I'm so caffeinated now that an individual years are just going to fly off and out the window. Um, 1054, um, uh, you know, yeah, no, it's, it's not, uh, it's not, uh, you know, Norman invasions in 1066, but the, the, uh, um, you know, so the, the great schism, the ecumenical, the ecumenical councils, you know, the other schisms like the Oriental Orthodox church, all those kind of things, all those things, period, hands down, all those things either, you know, uh, directly or explicitly have their root in the nature of Christ. And, you know, and this church is saying, that's not important, right? Or rather, that's not important for us to interfere in. They are, you know, you want to talk about, you know, I mentioned that spiritual chivalry and tossing off superstition and you know and service and you know the esoteric church of john you know and that foundational myth being the functional old testament of the pr primitive church and how palaprat's church is kind of our old testament in the sense of being our foundation and bedrock as a modern uh, you know jo joanite church this is one of the things where you know we can directly draw a line in be you know from kind of what they practice to what we practice and how that foundational thing is was important then and why it's important now. Because that thing I talked about in part one where the modern AJC seeks to leave a space where people can encounter the divine of their own accord, have an experience and give language to the ineffable when their own being. These guys, Palaprat and company, um, did it first. And for us, you know, it may be it may be radical to a certain degree, you know, especially, you know, when you see Christianity in the modern day in the throes of, you know, fundamentalism and that kind of thing and reckoning with itself, whether through scandal or theology or social issue, right? I mean, you know, it may be considered radical today, but it's not as dangerous in most countries as, as it was today, right? I mean, back then it was even more radical for them to do things at their specific time, right? Like, they're not just establishing, you know, it, they're not just establishing or trying to establish an administrative or a national um, independence from Rome and from, you know, the bulk of what they see as the negatives of Christian history. They're also asserting spiritual autonomy, you know, and the autonomy of the spiritual individual. And they're putting their money where their mouth is, you know, at a time where that is extremely, you know, um, not common, right? Like, you know, the, the, uh, um, so they're taking the fundamental, the, the central thing around all Christian, around all which Christian belief has been defined or separated or schismed or whatever, and and they're saying, you know, that is not for us to tell you, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, there are a lot of things, you know, there are a lot of things where we can say, you know, we're inspired by or we're, or we're, 
lineally descended from or were connected to or we take inspiration or, or poetry or myth you know from the church of, of palaprat there are some things where we can say what they literally did is worth repeating literally in the present day right you know and one of those things is that kind of freedom of conscience and uh you know palaprat was doing it uh in a time where it was not common and that is one of those things that bears maintaining this is this is actually maybe a good way to to maybe uh, help underline that point but also you think speak even a little more generally like i think um one of the things that uh, like i i've in, i hinted at this in our part one um and uh, just to say it even again here is that i came to gnosticism like i was interested in it from a um like i came across some of the weirder um myths and legends and stuff and i found that the the, the fundamental um uh, like the metaphors of whip. <laughs> yeah exactly and like uh like various layers that you need passwords to get through and stuff and yeah. and sophia and the divine flame and like all of that really spoke to me um uh, at, a, at a poetic level and that's kind of what brought me in and what what made me go like hey who's who's doing this now uh, i didn't come in from it i didn't come into it from a christian perspective like i grew up christian but uh, without i think uh, like a, a hardcore engagement with it like i didn't find it uh, compelling, maybe in the quite the same way, and and so I have found uh, the AJC's focus on Christianity to often be a thing that I need to engage with and and help. Like uh, uh, Shauna spent a lot of time helping explain some of this stuff to me, like how to be a Gnostic Christian uh, or a Christian Gnostic or or whichever of those. Um, uh, but I guess where I'm kind of coming from here, like I think you've you've done a good job explaining how the Palaprats primitive church, how the stuff that they were doing how there's kind of a, a really unique and individual and like, and go on your own path um, uh, element there, which is worth repeating. Um, but then at the same time, there is a sense in which like two of the three people on this call have callers. Like there's a sense where you guys look <laughs> like, uh, um, like on the street kind of thing. Like you will look pretty normal as a in terms of christian christianity priests that kind of thing somebody comes to an ajc mass a lot of it will seem pretty non-surprising if that makes sense like um yeah uh so uh and all of this is to say too is that i think there's also a lot of people for whom gnosticism is exciting because it is actually this move away from what they felt to be a mainstream Christianity. so why do we yeah. why do we why do we have this other stuff right yeah, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, you, you've already kind of gotten into it, but like, I, yeah, I guess just to kind of specifically underline that. Well, I think there's a certain, to a certain degree, right? I mean, you're not trying to, you know, much in the same way that Palpret's not trying to recreate the wheel. He's trying to restore it to its original motion, right? I mean, there's a certain thing like, you know, occasionally, very, 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 very occasionally, uh, I think I can count it on one hand in times of my life, you know, the amount of times I've worn an actual suit. Um, you know, I like, I often joke that I became a priest so I wouldn't have to wear a bloody tie. The, uh, um, there's a degree of truth there, but the, you know, if I wear a suit, uh, um, you know, does that mean I'm a businessman or does it mean that, you know, an image has become so dominated in a particular thing that now we, we take it as the thing, but that's not actually, that's not actually, you know, what's true, right? I mean, you know, uh, um, I mean, do we give up on rock and roll because people have told us that Nickelback is good music, right? We know it's not. We know it's not one for one, you know. We know it doesn't start or end there, you know, thank God, or else we'd, we'd have to, you know, torch the thing. The idea that, you know, we're appropriating, borrowing, carrying over or you know doing whatever something that comes from somewhere else um is false right um you know it's it's false i mean but it's an easy it's an easy impression or mistake to to make because we're so used to people misusing words misusing images misusing symbols or appropriate or whatever that we've now taken those things as as the given um, you know, and where it comes to Christianity, where it comes to the idea of, you know, the, you know, the, the Eucharist, or even like I mentioned, you know, the idea of universal salvation or any of those things, um, you know, uh, we have forgotten that they're a part of our own history, right? The, you know, the, you know, the, the Valentinians had, 
you know, the, the Eucharist, you know, the Sethians had baptism and uh, initiation, the Cathars had, you know, ministers and bishops, right? These are all these things that are a part of our, part of our, our history, part of the underground stream, part of the thing in the air, the, the, the foundation that we've, we've, you know, that we've abdicated. And when we try to take them back, people are like, well, this isn't you. No, it, it only seems like us because we've forgotten who we were to begin with, right? So the idea of, of you know, uh, Christianity, but a very different and alternative approach to, to Christianity, you know, I mean, there, there's a spiritual thing for, you know, reclamation of terms, of, of terms of return to roots, and all that other kind of stuff. But there's also much in the same way that I've talked about the Templar myth and the Joanite myth and all this stuff. There's also creating a space of common language, common story and, and, and common, you know, ritual. And the idea of a church, the idea of an ecclesia, which is, you know, Greek for assembly or community, um, you know, still has resonance and still has power. I mean, it has gained, um, you know, 2000 years of momentum. It's just there's a lot of people who are driving it in a different uh, uh, direction, different directions, right? Or directions that we don't like. This doesn't mean that we hop in and drive over the cliff, right? So the, uh, um, so I think, you know, why, you know, why we've chosen this particular thing or why we retain, um, you know, some of the elements of Christianity, whether it's theology or vestments or structure or whatever, um, is because it was, you know, at one point in time, you know, as Gnostics, as much ours, right? You know, it is the vehicle by which many of the ancient Gnostic sects chose to communicate and, and share in common and understand, um, you know, their spiritual experience. Um, you know, and if you find a, you know, if you if you if you find a tool that works, um, you don't you you use that. You don't uh, you know you don't throw that overboard and uh, create a, a whole thing from from scratch. That said, I mean, you know, we're, you know, we're doing, we're doing different work or we're trying to do different work. And uh, so you have to, you have to, you have to learn, you know, I guess those tools and that work, um, you know, in a different way, you have to understand it better and, and you have to uh, apply it better. I mean, you know, as they say, if you do what you've always done, you're always, you're going to get what you've always got. And so I think, you know, we have to be mindful to be aware of the tools, the language and the context, be aware of how they've been used or misused, misapplied, um, you know, some supplanted or abused um, and do something different with it. Right. And, and apply it. OK, where, you know, where is the uh, where is the important thing? Right. Like you have, you know, the idea of deacon, priests and bishops, which for many people throughout history have become a, a mediator, or intermediate intermediarship. Uh, type idea where in order to get to heaven, in order to get to the church, in order to get to spiritual experience, it requires somebody as a gatekeeper standing in your way to deem you worthy enough to give you these things, right? You know, it is the priest that gives you the Eucharist. It is the bishop that gives you your confirmation. You know, uh, uh, those, kind, those kind of things, you know, where they become you know, where they become the spiritual guardians or they become the, the, the mediators, you know, and for us, you know, these things were, these orders and these roles and this ministry and this kind of context, um, you know, isn't what's the, the bad idea, right? It's, it's the application of it, you know, so for us, you know, our priests are facilitators, right? I mean, we're not telling you the experience to have, we're not supplying you the experience, we're not the gatekeeper to your experience, we're the companion to your experience, ideally because we've had some experience and some introspection and some wrestling with our own foibles. So the idea is that we accompany each other, you know, uh, along the way as, as you know, kind of uh, fellow travelers on the paths or in some cases, you know, mountain guides, um, you know, or rest stops or way stations rather than being by the gate, the gate through which you must travel in order to get the truth or in order to get, you know, enlightenment or in order to to get the 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 Eucharist, so you know the the problem, as with anything, you know, the problem isn't necessarily in the in the system, you know, it's it's in the people and how they've they've applied it. Much in the same way, from a Gnostic perspective, the problem isn't in the earth; it's in the world, it's in the cosmos, it's in the it's in the imposed order, it's in the system we've overlaid over top of it, um, you know. And I think that you know a lot of the uh, 
um, you know, a lot of the mistakes of the past, you know, where, where the church or Christianity as an entity is uh, precisely because humans have, have abused it. So, you know, how do we, how do we create a system where, you know, Christianity and Gnosticism gets applied to a better end? And further to that, how do we create a system that not only, you know, is worked better, but has built into it the safeguards to not go off the rails again? And so that's important. I mean, you know, as a community, you know, while we come as individuals, we also need the ability to meet in common, you know, which means a degree of commonality of language, of commonality of ideas, a commonality of principles. And between Gnosticism and Christianity, we have that space and those tools, uh, you know, uh, uh, essentially to, to do that. So that's why that's why we 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 you know we've chosen it because it's the you know it is the most uh, uh, common language. It's it's not just something we've inherited by culture or by lineage. You know, it's a it's a it's a conscious choice, right? Um, yeah. You know, uh, there are, there are a lot of people who want the sacraments, who want the church, who want the things that are familiar or second nature to them. Um, they just didn't want the way it was being done, right? The the you know. Uh, you know the exclusion, uh, the 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 legalism, the who's in, the who's out, um, you know uh, those kind of things. The 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 structure, the the myth, the the magic, um, you know ha has value. They're they're you know they're not coming here to toss that off. They're coming here to actually get it because other people aren't doing it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, Does that well, make sense? It, it does a hundred percent. So, and I'm really glad that, uh, uh, that, that Jason was able to, to get, to toss that to you and you're able to unpack yeah, it. That was uh, a little uh, bit so of a well. rant. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, we're talking off air. This, like is, 10 minutes. this is, this is the rant show. I think that's what talk Gnosis is known for. So, and then, you, you know, I got to say, alert and I missed it. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, well, you know, uh, and, and this rarely happens just because we talk to really passionate people, right? Both scholars and practitioners. But, um, you, you know, the worst is we we have had the occasional guest who just, you know, speaks in like one sentence, right? <laughs> and then it's like, well, yeah. we need you to keep going. There's a lot here to talk about. Yeah. But no, I'm one of those people where you need to stop talking. Tell me to stop <laughs> talking. So. But that's, you know, that that's sort of uh, uh, Jason's role in the church, I, I, I think. I, I don't know if you can create some sort of like new title, you know, as, as the patriarch. But um, okay, continuing on with with uh, with Palo Pratt's church, did they teach some sort of, of pantheism or panentheism? And then if they did, I'm gonna, I guess I should get you to define what those what those words mean. Well, I think the, I mean, you you have pantheism, which is the idea that you know the universe and God are 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 one for one, and then you have panentheism, right, where the universe is contained within God, but God is is bigger than that, you know, where you know, the, the whole is contained within, but not, or identified with, but is not uh, um, fully contained with it, that, that God and the universe are there, but God is bigger yet still. And, and so these things are kind of, you know, parallel or related concepts. You find pan in, panentheism, um, you know, more common in esoteric uh, traditions and elements of Eastern Christianity or whatever. And you find the idea of pantheism um, being more common, for example, in things like modern neo-paganism, for example. Um, there is a thing where, and I don't know if it's because they lacked the theological language or, or just simply it was the, the, the contextual thing, but examining their beliefs, they had more or less, um, you know, pantheistic beliefs. I, I think they would, I think they would have, you know, conceived or understood, you know, kind of the idea that God is, is bigger than the universe, but what they did, what they what they fun, fundamentally said in their catechisms, as best as I can recall from you know my my tours through it. And like I said, please check the video um, for stuff while it was fresh in my brain. Is that they did have an idea essentially that everything in the universe is divine or divine or contained within God, um, right? As opposed to separated out from it. So you know the you know which is a kind of foundational idea to things like. The sacred flame, the divine spark, or even an emanation's cosmology. So while it's not specifically Gnostic, it has all the ingredients of, of Gnosticism. The idea that everything in the universe uh, contains the divine, um, um, you know, 
is implied in some portions of Christianity, like for example, more panentheistic beliefs, but but isn't necessarily explicit. And these guys are basically taking it and putting it as a as a major part of their thing. Yeah. It's a part of their catechism. It's something that they want people to know about and be informed of and and operate from. Yeah, and uh, I guess maybe my final question about beliefs is and, and teachings is. Th- were they kind of trying to walk the fine line or, or square the circle between being kind of a mystical church, but also a rational enlightenment church? Because you mentioned that they, they, they did sort of push the ideals of the enlightenment. They wanted to move away from superstition. So is, is there sort of a tension here or are they trying to do both, uh, would you say, be both a mystical church well, and an enlightenment I, I think, church? I, I, I think that's kind of, you know, baked into some of the stuff we've been talking about by not by not, um, you know, by not codifying, you know, belief down to a fine grain detail level, by leaving space for one's own experience of Christ, um, you know, those kind of things, they're implicitly creating the space for the mystical. Uh, can you still hear me? Because my batteries yep. are starting to go. Yeah, I still hear you. Okay. So, you know, by, you know, by you know, by, by dropping, you know, by dropping some of the, you know, imposed orthodoxy, by leaving room for the space of conscience and one's own experience, they're, you know, they're, they're not defining the mystical, they're, they're creating a space where it's, you know, where it can, can be had, right? You know, they're not necessarily, uh, you know, they're not necessarily saying we're a mystical church, they're get, but they are getting out of the way um, of folks in such a way where those folks can have that experience. I think. Right, right. You know, they're not they're not placing themselves between, you know, the person and the divine, yeah. which is where the mystical experience happens. Well, I, I think we uh, the, obviously we have more questions, and I know there's more you could talk to us about, Paolo oh, Brad, Lordy. but probably Power time to, Here we go. To, to start to start wrapping up. But that said, uh, now that the seal has been broken, our decades long uh, quest to have you on the show, uh, we'd love to to have you back, both to to talk about Chilonite and, and, and other issues. But uh, before you go, so last time I got you to do to do a plug for the Conclave, maybe just joanite.org you know eminence if, if people are out there and they're curious about the joanite church should they well, what they should what, what should they do um well they need to understand that i'm not necessarily the best advertisement for it uh <laughs> the uh you know i'm a i'm an advertisement for a portion of it right i mean i like to think that you know uh you know when when people see me they, they should think of the ajc but when people think of the ajc i'm not the first person they think of and i think that's a good thing Right. You know, that we have a variety. We have a community of voices. Um, You know, we have a community of ideas. We have a community of experience. And mine isn't gospel. There's a reason why you guys haven't heard from me on this show for a decade. Right. Not just because I don't like going on camera or I can't be arsed to to talk about whatever, you know, or it means I might actually have to, you know, shave and get dressed. I mean, it's not just that. Um, it is that, but the, the, you know, there's, it's because, you know, much in the same way that Palaprat is trying to get out of the way, you know, of his, his own people and create a, you know, a safe and structured environment where those experiences and where the divine can be met, is that this is what the AJC has done throughout its, its, its history. Um, you know, and it's, and it starts with the people, you know, in charge, so to speak, getting out of the way right? Getting out of the way, not being the dominant voices. I mean, if I had started talking 20 years ago and kept on talking, you would be, you would easily be convinced that my ideas and the AJC's ideas are one for one. And that's not true, right? I have my own ideas that are entirely independent of our statement of principles and, uh, you know, and of my own theological explorations and esoteric explanations that, that have nothing to do with the church, right? And so, you know, the best way for me to prove that is not to come up here and tell you that's the case, because that's another version of the same problem. The best thing is to literally stay out of view. And that's kind of what, you know, that's kind of what I've tried to do throughout my history is to allow its own people to create its own body of work, its own body of practice, 
you know, my job is to complete, to create a safe environment and to keep it from running off the rails, to make sure the bills get paid and to make sure that the, the people that we put in front of her, the public to assist and facilitate their experience um, are not jerks, right? Um, you know, that's my job. The, you know, it's not my job to give you the spiritual experience. It's your job to have it. It's my job to get out of the way from it, right? So, you know, the best advertisement for the AJC um, is not me, it's its people. Come to Conclave, go to its community, experience what it has to offer. Um, don't let me tell you about it. Have your own experience. Decide whether or not I'm full of crap, right? You know, the... Uh, you know, and um, and if you don't, if, if, if you come and you decide you don't like it and it doesn't work for you or whatever, then the AJC has still done its job because it's gotten you one step closer to the place where you need to be, even if that place isn't us.